pause a minute after that hit zero. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I am delighted to be here with Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, who is introducing the companion legislation in the House. Uh, and here is the bottom line. Uh, and what we're dealing with is an issue today that gets nowhere near the kind of discussion that it needs. Uh, some of you may have noticed that there was a Federal Reserve report that came out just a few days ago. And what it said is that the bottom half of the American people, 50% of the American people, have almost zero in wealth. That means they've got nothing in the bank. So if you've got nothing in the bank and you're living paycheck to paycheck, guess what happens if your kid gets sick? Guess what happens if your car breaks down? Guess what happens if you have any kind of an emergency? You've got to go to the bank. You've got to get money. You've got to borrow money. And the way people borrow money today is through their credit cards. Mm -hmm. And now we have a situation, and this to me is not just an economic issue, it is a moral issue, where you have Wall Street and credit card companies charging people outrageously high interest rates when they are desperate and they need money to survive. You know, Alexandra, I suspect you know this, but every mm -hmm. major religion on earth, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, has condemned usury. That's right. Because it is really disgusting. I mean, I mm -hmm. don't know a better word. Is if somebody is desperate and you say, you're desperate, mm -hmm. you need money to take care of your children, to feed your family, well, I'm going to lend you money, but mm -hmm. it's going to be at an outrageously high interest mm -hmm. rate. And that's what Wall Street has done. So right now, you're looking at a medium, cre median credit card interest rate now of over 21%. That means half of the American people are actually paying more than that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're earning 10 bucks an hour now, you don't have enough money to take care of your family, you're going to be paying 22 25% interest rates. And then on top of that, what is not widely dis discussed, you go to Macy's, you go to Kohl's, you go to any large department mm -hmm. store, and they say, mm -hmm. hey, get our credit card. Well, you get their credit card. What you don't know is you're going to be paying something like 27% interest rates on that credit card. That's right. 27%. Now, how much do the banks borrow money at? They borrow money from the Fed at 2.5%, and then they charge people 18 20 25% interest rates. And here is what is even uglier. The poorer you are, mm -hmm. the more desperate you are, the higher the interest rates are. Now, uh, what Alexandria and I are proposing in our legislation is something that is not complicated. It just takes us back to where we were a number of years ago, and that is that no bank in this country uh, should have credit card interest rates of over 15%. So we're bringing back the concept of usury laws mm -hmm. where people cannot try to, where banks cannot try to get blood out of a stone. Uh, previously, uh, you had states like Alabama that charged maximum 8%, Vermont 12%. Many states had maximum uh, amounts of interest rates that credit card companies can charge. But as a result of the Marquette decision mm -hmm. back in 1980, I think, uh, essentially that was nullified. And we're going to bring that back. Last point that I want to make, and I'll give it over to Alexandria, is that an additional crisis, but part of this whole situation, is that many poor people don't have access to banking services. That's right. Because the big banks are not worried about somebody who, you know, makes 10 bucks an hour. They can't make enough money off of that. So we have got to move to a universal banking through the postal system. You got post offices in almost every community in America. They should be available to provide basic banking services so that people do not have to go into payday lenders, which mm -hmm. is a whole other story. So That's you think right. of Wall Street as disgusting. Think about payday lenders charging people 100, 150% interest rate. So mm -hmm. this is an important issue. We just uh, put something up on our social media the other day. We've got 1,500 people who called in to talk about what these high interest rates are doing to their lives. Millions of people are experiencing this. So this is an mm -hmm. issue we need your help on. We need it in the House. We need it in the Senate. 
let's get involved, let's pass this. Mm -hmm. Alexandra? Absolutely, and I think that this is, you know, when we talk about coming together to solve our problems as a country, this is one of the best ways that we can come together. These predatory loans and high interest rates impact rural communities. They impact urban communities like those that I represent. Um, and, and it's funny because you would think that in a densely populated community like the Bronx or like Jackson Heights that you'd be able to have a bank on every corner. Um, but what we actually see is that in poor and lower income urban communities, there are way fewer banks per capita. You know, there was a there was a, a study that showed in Compton there was one bank for every twenty five thousand people uh, back in two thousand six, and that was from Brookings. And so, it shows that it's not just access to capital, but just the ability to go somewhere and cash a check. Uh, it can be very difficult whether you're in a very rural part of the country or even in uh, certain urban neighborhoods. And you know. We talk about payday lending, and in New York, we were really lucky in that we've, we worked very hard to outlaw payday lending in the state. Uh, but what happens when, when everyday banks start to charge higher and higher interest rates? Essentially, your credit card becomes a payday loan. And uh, this is not anything radical, because we had these laws for a very long time in red states, we had them in blue states, we had them in half of the United States, had usury laws until 1978 when they were repealed. And ever since then, um, it's given a blank check for credit card companies and for big banks to charge extortion level interest rates to the poor. And the reason this is a moral issue is because we should not be uh, using people's misfortune and using people's uh, income status as a basis for extortion and as a basis for predatory lending. 15%, um, by the way, is a lot. 15% interest is a lot. So you can run a bank, you can continue to be profitable, um, but to charge 30, 40% interest rates is no less than extortion. I heard, uh, I heard from constituents in my own district, people have to take out loans connected to um, our, our horrible state of health care and our inhumane sure. state of health care in the United States, that I was just hearing from a constituent who had to take out a $40,000 loan to pay for his mother's cancer treatments. And they gave him, the bank gave him, over a 20% interest rate so that he could pay for his mother's cancer treatment. So what happens? He was paying, this was back in 2006, he was paying them uh, co completely uh, on time, $800 a month he was paying on this $40,000 loan to keep his mother alive. And when the financial crisis hit, he lost his job, he was struggling to make payments, and without telling him, they sold his loan off to a different debt servicer. They sued him in court, he got no notice for it, and then it wasn't until his wages were getting garnished that he found out that there was a settlement for him to pay $53,000 on a $40,000 loan, of which he had already paid $28,000. To keep his mother alive. To keep his mother alive. And that is legal, and it is common in the United States of America, but it is not normal, and it is not humane. And I should add that this year, uh, people in the United States will pay $122 billion in credit card interest, and that is a 50% increase in just five years. So what you have, you have payday lenders over here, which is beyond belief. I mean, mm -hmm. that is just disgraceful beyond imagination. But you got all these guys in their three-piece suits who are now the new loan shark uh, hoodlums, uh, that we used to see in the movies, you know? We see in the movies, the guys, I'll break your <laughs> kneecap if you don't pay back what we owe. Well, I don't know that they break kneecaps. But now they'll take your home. No, that's right. Maybe do leave something even worse. Or maybe pull the plug on your mom uh, who needs medical treatment. So let's be clear about what we're talking about. We're talking about economic brutality. We're talking about mm -hmm. some of the most powerful people in the world people who make millions and millions of dollars a year in banks that make billions of dollars a year in profit, and they see a real profit center in going after desperate people who, because wages have been stagnant for 40 years, 
cannot afford the basic necessities of life. Mm-hmm. So today we're telling Wall Street and the payday lenders that enough is enough. Your grotesque and disgusting behavior is not acceptable in America, and we're going to change it. Mm-hmm. And this is an issue that impacts zillions of people all over this country. And I think a lot of people don't even know it. They go into a store and they buy a refrigerator. They don't know that they're paying 26% interest and, rates. And, you know, it, goes, it, it just goes to show that all of these issues are connected, and it all comes back to our pocketbook. When we see these, these corporations like Sears or like we saw with the bankruptcy with Toys R Us, is that these private equity groups are taking over these everyday um, retail companies. And they stop being companies that are retail, and they start being essentially finance companies. So it's not, it's not a, a department store that sells you a credit card. It's a credit card company that lures you into a department store. <laughs> and that's what's going on that's right now. That's a funny way to look at it, but that's true. In other words, a very significant percentage of the profits of many of these department stores are not involved in selling you the product. Mm -hmm. They're getting significant interest rates uh, when you charge to buy that product. And Mm -hmm. that is just quite amazing. All right, what else you got? Well, so I think it's, it's also important to connect the justice piece to this as well, because when we look at how all of these things stack up and add up, they concentrate in rural poor communities and um, and urban communities and communities of color as well. When you look at uh, mortgages, communities of color tend to pay much higher interest rates um, on their mortgages, and we see that as James Baldwin as James Baldwin said, it's expensive to be, be poor. poor. It's, it's, Stay on that point for a minute. Does everybody mm-hmm. know what what she meant by that? And that's a profound point. If you're wealthy, you have good credit, Mm -hmm. right? You're earning a good income. You go to the bank, you can borrow money at a low rate. Go to a good grocery store in your Mm -hmm. community, buy food that is healthy and good, Mm -hmm. not too much. You want to buy a car, you buy it with low interest rates. If you're poor, what happens? If you're poor, your interest rates are much higher. You live in a food desert, so your average head of lettuce or your average, you know, bit of spinach is much more expensive than it is in other communities. And all in all, over and over again, you just think about, I remember when I was waitressing and I had a checking account. Now, with a lot of these corporate checking accounts, uh, before I had pulled my money out and and joined a nonprofit one, a nonprofit bank, um, what happens is that you need to keep a minimum of, say, $1,500 in your bank account for all 30 days of the month so that you don't get charged $25 for them to have the privilege of holding your money. <laughs> and so you're paying 25 bucks a month just to keep your money in a bank account. And the average American has, so many Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. So this, we're talking about the majority of, of people that have incurred a $25 a month uh, charge to just keep your money in a checking account. We're talking about even if you try to avoid that charge and you take your check to a check cashing place, which is very common here um, in, in my community, you take it to a check cashing place, they're charging you 10% just for, for 10%. the percent Sometimes 6 10%. Just to for, cash a check. To cash a check. It is expensive to be poor. And if you can't afford... Um, you know, a year ago, I didn't have health insurance. A year ago, I was paying for all of my medicine in cash. And what you see over and over again, as much as these pharmaceutical companies say, oh, we have these waivers and things like that, it's, it's either you're paying up front or you're paying with your time, with the amount of bureaucracy that's given to you um, in order for you to get a fair shake. And I think that what makes us so radical, as people like to call our ideas, so radical, is that we think that some things are just wrong to make a buck off of. And it's wrong to make a buck off of people's vulner- most vulnerable and moments in their lives. Des- Let me repeat that again. I mean, Alexandra gave one example. You can give a million. In this country today, people are paying $88 billion on interest rates because of health care costs. Mm-hmm. So we are the only country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people. Somebody in your family ends up in the hospital. You gave a very good example. You come out of the hospital with a $100,000 bill. If you're a working class person, how are you going to pay that if mm-hmm. you don't want to see your credit 
destroyed. Mm -hmm. You go out and you borrow money. You borrow money at exorbitant interest rates, and you become poorer. Absolutely. You're spending half your, not half, but a significant part of your income paying off the interest rates. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, your wages remaining stagnant. This is why mm -hmm. we are living in a culture where the rich are becoming much richer, and so many people are struggling, just trying to claw their way mm -hmm. out of the desperation they see. And this is part of the bloody problem right here. That's and I know, I know, they're taking on Wall Street. Trust mm -hmm. me, I've been doing it for a few years. These people have enormous political influence mm -hmm. over the Republican Party, over the Democratic Party, over the media. That this is not an issue that has been significantly discussed. Mm -hmm. How often, when it you turn on the TV, do you see this issue? We issue? never see it, and it's an issue that impacts people so much. It impacts when it comes to health care, or even in my district, I represent Rikers Island, which is one of the most brutal jails in America. And in New York State, we still have cash bail. So what happens if your 15-year-old son gets picked up because he's uh, accused of jumping a turnstile because he can't afford a metro card? Or if your kid gets picked up because someone said that another young man of color who looked like him had allegedly run off with a backpack. Well, if you cannot afford your bail, you get thrown to Rikers. And if you have to resort to a loan to get to afford to bail out, let's say your husband, who's a, who's a primary income earner, or because we're talking about time spent away from work when you're thrown in jail. So if you have to take a payday loan or take or go to a bail bondsman because uh, cash bail is another system where really our entire court system is a system where justice is purchased. Everybody hear what she's saying. This is what she's saying. This is, I mean, you stop and you think about people saying, this can't go on. This is America, mm -hmm. right? So somebody in the family gets arrested and their alternative is that they're going to stay in jail awaiting their uh, trial. For an unknown period of time. Exactly. All right. That's a whole other, we got mm -hmm. a whole other issue we can talk yeah. about. You got the 20% of the American people today are in jail mm -hmm. because they can't afford cash bail. Okay. So the wife says, well, I got to get my husband out of jail. So where's she going to go to get the money? She's going to borrow the money at an outrageous payday lender to get her husband out of jail. And she falls, family falls further and further into poverty. And ultimately, I mean, what this comes down to is the issue of greed which is permeating every aspect of our society. It is Wall Street. It is the drug companies. Don't get me off in the drug companies. Ten of them made $69 billion in profit last year, but you can't afford the medicine that you need. It is the insurance companies that pay their CEOs outrageous compensation packages. You can't afford health insurance. You know, it is the fossil fuel industry making billions of dollars as they destroy the planet. Mm -hmm. On and on it goes. And this is the issue. But I think Focusing on Wall Street for a start. They are in the middle of everything. You've got six financial institutions in this country of assets equivalent to 54% of the GDP in America. They're controlling trillions and trillions of dollars. Okay? So I really do appreciate um, uh, Alexandra uh, and, and working with me on this issue. We've got to call attention to it. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, from a political point of view, we need millions of people to stand up and just say this is disgusting. This is outrageous. This is immoral. It cannot be allowed uh, to continue. That's right. Yeah, no, and I'm just thankful to be able to move this in both the House and the Senate. It can be very challenging sometimes to find, uh, to find working partners. And I think that what we're really doing is setting out a vision of what a moral America looks like and what a moral economy looks like. And that we can be a prosperous nation. We can be one where working people are paid enough to live, where, you are, where your health needs are covered, where you can work 40 hours a week and survive. All of this is possible, but we just have to fight for it. Absolutely. And that's really what this is, what this is about. And none of these, these are not radical ideas. They exist in many cases in countries all over the world. Who in America thinks that desperate people should be forced to pay 100%? 200% interest rates uh, on to borrow money. Nobody believes in that. But you've got a lot of powerful special interests here who have enormous influence over the Congress, over the Senate, and that's why we have what we have. And our job is to rally the American people for what are not radical ideas, but just ideas that deal with justice and dignity. That's all. Absolutely. All right, what do we got, guys? We've got some questions coming in. Got just a couple. One is... Um, asked how to fight back against the, the big banks and their lobbyists to oppose this 
when they start fighting back on Capitol Hill and in the states. Mm. So the question was, how do we fight back against the extremely powerful financial services lobby and big, big bank lobby when, when this bill hits Congress? Uh, I think one big one is do not under, especially for us here on, on the House side, do not underestimate the power of calling your member. People say it over and over again. It's almost like your dentist telling you to floss, but <laughs> I'm telling you, I see it firsthand, you know, members really do respond to pressure. And so when you call your member and say, hey, where are you on this bill? Can you co-sponsor it? I believe that this is right. Can you put that in there? Um, it's something that, that's really important. And we, we will put up information to help you lobby and advocate for it. Because sometimes your member will push back. They'll say, well, if we, if we cap it out at 15%, then no, no poor person will get a loan. That's maybe what they will tell you. But what we can then say is, A, we should have a non-for-profit public option for basic banking services, and we should be piloting these projects right. um, through the U.S. Postal Service or, or in any other number of ways. And, um, and also it's just based on the basic principle that this should not be a, a profiteering aspect of the country. We've had these laws before. Credit unions abide by them. And guess what? They were one of the only ones that didn't need a bailout in 2008. And they are doing very, very well. Look, bad things happen in Congress because politicians assume that people are not paying attention or are not prepared to fight back. On this issue, you do a poll out there whether you think that Wall Street should charge people 30 percent interest rates. Mm -hmm. I doubt that very many people think that mm -hmm. they should. But A, nobody knows about it, and B, nobody is now in an organized effort to resist it and fight back. So Alexandria's point is exactly right. Stand up, fight back, get on the phone call, mm -hmm. get on the telephone, start emailing. You know, and if you want to organize around a local bank and say, you know, talk about the greed of that bank. Uh, you can do that as well. Let's call attention to this issue, and once we do, and millions of people rally around it, we can win this thing. Josh. One last question. Um, Marty remembers when credit card rates uh, at the state level were as low as 5%. Um, what happened, and how can we get back to where states can do their own thing? Right, the question rates? is, there was once a time where if you lived in Vermont or you lived in Alabama, you lived any place, there was a limit to what the credit card companies could charge in interest. There were usury laws. And that was done away with essentially in 1980 by a Supreme Court decision that said that banks could uh, hold charters in South Dakota or in Delaware mm -hmm. where there were no interest rates. So they all did that. Uh, and then essentially uh, all of the uh, limits on interest rates were nullified. And we got to where we are right now. So essentially what we are doing is going around that decision, and, and here's a point to be made. It's not just that we think 15% is a low interest rate. Mm -hmm. This will give states the opportunity to go even lower than that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I'm just glad that we've had the opportunity to push the needle forward, and I think that, um, that this is really what we need, and we need to continue the charge on advancing the ideas that are going to define not just uh, the, the Democratic or Republican agenda, but really define the country. And what I love about big and ambitious ideas, um, whether it's this or whether it's the Green New Deal, is that it forces the Republicans to change their agenda, too, because this is us going on offense. Right. And, for example, right now, it is no longer a politically tenable, ten, a politically tenable position to deny climate change. We got Mitch McConnell on the record for the first time saying climate change is real and man-made. And now we're going to get Republicans on the record saying uh, extortionary interest rates are wrong and that we got to do something about it. That's what we're going to get Republicans on the record to do. That's right. I mean, these ideas are ideas that the overwhelming majority of the American people believe in. So it's not that they're radical. What is radical is that you have a Congress that is so far out of touch mm -hmm. of where the American people are. The idea that health care is a right, not a radical idea, most mm -hmm. people don't think so. The idea that you don't charge outrageous interest rates, not a radical idea. The idea that we have to move boldly to address climate change, mm -hmm. not a radical idea. All right? 
But these guys will continue to get away with murder unless people stand up and fight back. Mm -hmm. So that's the message today. We can win this thing. We okay. Can. Let's go forward together on it. All right? See ya. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs>